who is going to speak about trauma presentation based on images. Dr. Ferrada is an associate professor of the Department of Surgery of Virginia Commonwealth University. And she also is serving as director of the unit surgery. Um, she did the critical care fellowship in trauma ICU also in the Virginia Commonwealth University. She's a great educator. Ella se entrenó en uh, cirugía general en Beth Israel Reconnaissance Medical Center en Boston y completó su fellowship en critical care en Pittsburgh y pasó un año adicional en, en, en shock trauma center en, en Maryland eh, como, su, como el primer fellow de acute care surgery. Eh, ella está muy interesada en la parte de educación particularmente en, eh, en entrenar a los cirujanos a realizar ultrasonido. Es un miembro activo del American College of Surgery, de la, en, la, en el, el facultativo del ultrasonido, eh, y director internacional de los cursos de ultrasonido de UCETS para la Sociedad Panamericana. Courses for the Pan American Trauma Society. That has given her the opportunity to be not only a local but also an international educator. She is quite related to the Virginia chapter of the uh, American Surgical Association as a treasurer of the Virginia chapter. And she's currently in charge of the Educational and Research Committee of the Pan American Trauma Society. And she's uh, also not to the Young Fellowship Association. She has been one of the women in the Virginia chapter as a surgeon, Dr. Ferrada. You have the floor. And she's also very beautiful. Thank you very much, Felipe. Voy a cambiar a hablar en inglés, si está bien para... Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. introduction. I have nothing to disclose in the sense that nobody's uh, paying me to say anything here. However, um, I have a lot of personal biases that will become obvious in the next uh, few minutes. Hypotension. The intuitive reaction of hypotension, especially if you're a surgeon, is to give a lot of crystalloids. However, we have just heard the entire morning saying how aggressive crystalloid resuscitation can be harmful for our patients, and that a more restrictive strategy might be beneficial, stopping bleeding earlier and giving a, a balanced resuscitation with one-to-one. -one. But more importantly to um, what to give is also thinking if we should be giving anything, right? We know heart rate and blood pressure, and even hematocrit, are not very good measurements of shock and resuscitation. When you have a patient that is hypotensive and uh, you increase the intrathoracic pressure, the IVC is going to kink, and with that decrease in, um, in that IVC collapse, there's going to be decrease in venous return, right ventricular stroke volume, left ventricular preload, and cardiac output. That's what happens when you in, you have somebody in shock, you intubate them, you start giving them blood, uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation, and all of a sudden your patient is hypotensive near code. It's because of that, the kinking of the IVC. In fact, there's a lot of literature saying how IVC variation could be a useful parameter in patients that are in the ventilator, in patients that have dialysis, even in children to uh, manage the degree of, of uh, dehydration after gastroenteritis. In our experience, IVC diameter is not something that we measure in numbers or uh, crazy difficult measurements. Just with a visual gestalt, we can say somebody has a flat IVC or a full IVC and help us guide resuscitation. Uh, IVC is not perfect. When you intubate somebody and you increase uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation, the IVC is going to be a little bit bigger. So therefore, uh, it's not perfect. It, it's uh, something that you have to correlate clinically. Uh, looking at the heart in, the, in its entirety and knowing how much blood is inside the heart and if it's, if it's contracting or not is probably a little bit more useful. But uh, the good news is that if you actually acquire this skill, which is not that hard to do, 
You can see the IVC if it's full or flat. You can allows you for a dynamic assessment of volume, not to guess from a CVP or a pressure from a swan if your patient is hypovolemic or not, or if it's contracted or not. You have the opportunity to see that. And it provides you with information for both sides of the heart. We all have patients that have very high risk of having acute right pulmonary failure from PEs. And we have a ton that we have diagnosed with medical students, fellows, residents, everybody in our unit knows how to use this tool. In fact, there's a lot of papers in the literature describing how a uh, surgeon or a non-cardiologist, a cardiologist, I, just, I should say, can use a full-service echo. What does a full-service echo mean? It's the complicated echocardiogram that has all the measurements, that has all the Doppler measurements. It takes about 10 minutes to do. Um, it's not rocket science. It's a skill that could be acquired. Um, this uh, slide that says surgeon, that surgeons should be replaced by anybody that is at the bedside taking care of a patient that is decompensated. Because I truly believe that this skill can be acquired by anybody. It will be available whenever you are, not when the cardiologists are, which is generally in my experience from, 5 p from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Usually people don't get sick during those narrow hours. It will give you real-time information about volume and about cardiac function. And the fact that you are the one treating that patient and understanding what's going on, it will increase the yield of finding what is it that you, you want to find. And I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show you how. How many here actually right now at this point you use echocardiogram to resuscitate patients in your ICU? So a few. Okay. Now, limited echocardiogram. Why, why did we decide to do something less complicated, faster, and uh, more available? This is how the trauma bay looks in Virginia Commonwealth University, and I think it's, a, um, it's an assessment that is accurate for most ICUs in the United States, or I should say in, uh, in um, high-income countries. Look, the patient arrive and there's already somebody looking at the airway, somebody's trying to take out the, the, um, the clothes immediately, somebody's hooking them up to the, to the monitors. But that's not how the trauma bay looks everywhere in the world. This patient here doesn't have the human resources to help him get better, doesn't have the technical resources to help him get better. There's, uh, according to the World Health Organization, there needs to be an ultrasound machine, 2D ultrasound machine, everywhere in the world where you're treating uh, uh, pregnant patients. With that 2D ultrasound machine, we can bring the high skills resuscitation of an ICU of a, of a high income country to this patient in need. Why wouldn't we want to do that? So we um, started training, we trained everybody uh, from the people that were just done with fellowship to somebody that was in training, uh, out of training for more than um, 29 years. It was a very um, a small, so surgeons have a very short attention spam, as I'm sure all of you know. And so we did a very, uh, uh, 70 minutes of didactics and 25 minutes of hands-on. Then we timed those surgeons and see in real life how long will it take you to do this, about four, four minutes. We asked the cardiologists to do their former echocardiogram and when it came to a contractility measured by ejection fraction, the correlation was 100%. And the cardiologists didn't like that that much. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we measured the lactate after we uh, resuscitated the patients. It decreased in all patients. And then we gave a score to the attendings, and it was about 88% after the training. This is how the lactate showed. Then we decided, can we bring this to the initial phase of resuscitation? Because we are right now blindly uh, taking care of patients. And it's true that actually feeling the patient and feeling the pulse and seeing if they're sweaty or not could be reliable ways of knowing if somebody's hypotensive or if somebody's in shock. However, at least if you have an echocardiogram, it's an objective measurement that you can store and you can come back and evaluate later. We uh, did a pilot study with 148 patients. Most of them were hypovolemic, but to our surprise, some of them were not. They were hypotensive and not hypovolemic. And for patients older than 65 years, it was this LTTE, which is limited echocardiogram, was changed their, um, their therapy in 96% of the cases. So in 96% of the time, we were wrong about what we were gonna do for them, for the patients. 
Then we did a, a randomized control trial and we include everybody that had a, the highest tier of uh, trauma and uh, um, they were hypotensive and we randomized them to have an LTT on even days. And we, find, we found that patients that had an LTT had a lot less IV fluids, uh, spent less time in the trauma bay um, uh, when going to the operating room, had a higher rate of ICU admission, and the mortality, although it was not statistically significant, it was lower. Now, in our experience, traumatic brain injury is about one third of our emissions, but represent about 50% of our mortalities. Uh, so we did a, a suburb analysis and found out that they got a lot less IV fluids and the mortality decreased from nearly 40% to 15% when we were using this tool. So what are we saying? Ultrasound save lives? Absolutely not. Physicians with a brain save lives. And if you have anything that will help that brain make the right decision, such as a tool, that, a visual tool that you can see what to do for that patient, that, that, that can help you make the right decision. Uh, what windows did we use? Um, I don't have a pointer here, but you will see in the, in the uh, upper side, you see a personal long, then below a personal short, an apical and a subsiphoid. Um, it, they're the same windows that we use for formal echocardiogram, and I'm going to show you videos of what you should see. The uh, structure in the lower side of the, win of the, um, of the, of the um, slide is the left ventricle, and then uh, you see you have a cut of the aortic valve with the left ventricular outflow tract, and the upper uh, structure is the right ventricle. And this is how it looks in, uh, in normal life. Mind you that this image was acquired in the trauma bay by a, by a trainee. <laughs> so look at the heart. Look at the amount of blood that is inside of the heart and how much blood comes out every time that the heart beats. It's about 50%, right? There's no, they're not completely closing, so it's not empty, but there's movement in the heart. So while reading about uh, echocardiogram, when we started, way before we started all this project about five years ago, I realized that there's a lot of literature from cardiologists saying from their literature that all their calculations about ejection fraction are equivalent to actually an educated visual gestalt, which means that if we educate ourselves, we can have the same uh, visual gestalt that they have. This is a normal window. In other uh, terms, this patient is not hypovolemic and the heart is contracting appropriately and there's no uh, pericardial effusion. Now, uh, do, you, do you see the difference between that and this one? Don't respond all the, at the same time because it's deafening. Yes, do you see it or not? Yes or no? Okay, so you see that the movement of the muscle is minimal. The, 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 the heart is completely full, and the only thing that you're seeing is the movement of the valves. <laughs> this patient is hypotensive and is in your trauma bay, and you have this view. Are you gonna give them fluids? <laughs> not if you want him to survive, right? Okay, so this is a poor window because uh, sometimes we don't get perfect images because we have a lot of trainees. But in this, you can see a pericardial, pericardial fluid. Black in ultrasound is fluid, as you can see, because black inside the heart is blood. That is fluid in the pericardium because it's excluding the thoracic aorta. That dot right there in the lower part is the, is the cut of the thoracic aorta. But look, what I wanted you to see in this image is see the, the function of the ventricle. Even though the patient has a significant pericardial effusion, the left ventricle is about 50% of blood that comes in and out. There's no kissing walls, right? Look at the difference with this one. If you try to ignore the humongous pericardial effusion that this patient has, take a look at the left ventricle. Is it full or empty? Empty, right? Don't let me say what you don't think it is right. It is empty. So then this patient on top of the pericardial effusion is high, clearly hypovolemic. This patient will benefit from resuscitation. Parasternal short, you take it from uh, your view of parasternal long and you rotate it slowly, um, clockwise, and you're gonna get a parasternal short look at, of your heart. What you, look, you, what you see inside of the heart that looks like a fish mouth is, a, um, is, the, is the mitral valve, and then that's the left ventricle and above is the right ventricle. This is the best, best view to be able to see your left ventricular function. This is a normal view. The right side is not pushing against the left. 
The heart is contracting symmetrically, as you can see. It's not empty. This is the one time where kissing is not good. No kissing walls. It actually stays open, right? And there's no pericardial effusion. Look at the difference with this one. Can you tell the difference? Yes or no? Okay, and we have been talking about this for less than five minutes, and I know that most of you said that don't use echocardiogram. So in less than five minutes now, you have a visual gestalt that would allow you to see the difference between somebody that is hypovolemic and is not. Okay, and this is, a, and this is an effusion. The effusion is completely surrounded the heart, but the heart is, is the heart hypovolemic, yes or no? No, no kissing walls, great. A, a, a apical window. So um, the normal heart, if you were looking at an echocardiogram and not doing it yourself, you can get confused between the right or the left. The right heart should be about 60% of the, of, the, of the size of the left. And in ultrasound, it looks kind of rough inside instead of, um, instead of um, smooth. And even if you have uh, ventricular, uh, right ventricular hypertension, you still will see the difference because it looks triangular, rough inside, and it's not as thick as the left ventricle. Um, this was a video, but um, the, uh, of contracting appropriately, you see the left ventricle to the right of the of uh, of the um, of the slide, and the right ventricle above. <clears throat> What's wrong with this gentleman? I'll tell you the story. He was a gentleman that had a pelvic fracture, and he was doing great and was ready to go to rehab, and then all of a sudden became short of breath and hypotensive, 80 over 40. Um, to give you a hint, the right ventricle is the one that is the one that has the big goomba beating inside. What is the cause of right, acute right-sided right-sided ventricular failure in a patient with a pelvic fracture? Pulmonary emboli. So this patient with this with this uh, um, image only, which was obtained by a trainee, received a heparin bolus and drip without getting a CTA, a console by uh, cardiothoracic, got an embolectomy, and yes, spent a lot of time in the hospital after the embolectomy, but survived and didn't have a delay. In contrast, this is a patient with poor contractility. Look at the muscle, not really moving. You don't have to be a rocket science to recognize movement or not. So most of us do ultrasound for trauma in the trauma bay as a fast. So most of us are familiar with the subcyphoid window, which is the upper, um, the, in the upper side with the, with the flat uh, horizontal way of the probe. If you turn it, you can see the IVC and it will give you a measurement of volume. So this is, again, it's supposed to be a video, but it's, not, it's, it's showing you the liver above, and you can see the four chambers of the heart, which will allow you to see, again, the right side, the side of the right side, the, um, the amount of volume, and the effusion. And if you turn it around, and I tell my trainee, this is like a lollipop. This here, the, the head of the lollipop is the, is the heart, and then the stick is the IVC. And you can see, of course, you have to correlate clinically. If this patient is not hypotensive, what would you give them any, anything, even though the IVC is variating? But if this patient is hypotensive, it's not completely full. It is variating. Can you appreciate the variation? Now compare with, compare with this one, maybe. Compare with this one. Different, right? This is a 76-year-old male that came to a trauma bay after two liters of crystalloid was given to him because he was hypotensive with a huge IVC. Probably not a good idea to continue giving them a crystalloid. And then this is just ridiculous. Like, if you cannot like, see the difference between that small IVC and this one, this, is, this, this, this doesn't require much training to see the difference. This is a plethoric, very, very full IVC. Probably not a good idea to give intravascular resuscitation. So we took that course that we gave to our providers in Medina Commonwealth University and with the uh, amazing support of the Pan American Trauma Society we made it into something that we can train train the trainers that are going to continue to uh, train um, more people in uh, several places that that require the skill. Uh, the initial ultrasound courses that were done only for abdominal ultrasound were actually created by Dr. Ruyano, who's here. And then this was um, given as the, as the advanced ultrasound course. And now it has been given in several places in Brazil, in Colombia, in Panama, Uruguay, Paraguay, um, Chile, in some places of the United States. 
And we also have international visitors that have come and get trained. So we have trained nurses, nurse practitioners, surgeons, paramedic, residents, everybody, anybody that uh, wants to put in the time to get training will get good at this because let's face it, we do more complicated, and especially surgeons, we do more complicated things in the operating room rather than um, taking a look at an image, correct? Um, so, in conclusions, this is the this is the stethoscope. Actually, I uh, when I was training in Colombia, I used to have one of these. This is the stethoscope. This is yeah, just as historic perspective. This is the stethoscope uh, and how we used to listen to people's hearts and help us uh, give an idea of what's going on with the patient with physical exam. And then in 1940, Rapport Inspire created a, something that looked like an stethoscope but a little heavier. Dr. Lidman, who was a physiology professor in Harvard, made it into something very similar of what we carry or don't carry in our pockets today. And for more than 50 years, we have been using the same technology to evaluate our patients. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, right? We have all that. But we still use in a 1960s instrument to see what's going on to, with our patients. Just, I just think that maybe, you know, if, we, if, the, if the only wall that is between us growing in technology is training ourselves, maybe it's time that we all can make a change together. We can do it. Thank you. Any questions in the audience locally? Dr. Maddox. Is there an app we can put on The question for the uh, viewing audience was, is there an app or a, a local uh, tablet-based technology that we can put in our pocket to help facilitate this? There is an app that can help you do calculation. There is not an app right now. Uh, there's an app for training for sure. There is an ultrasound machine that is as small as a cell phone, which is a little bit expensive at this, at this point. And the views are not great, but it's better than not having it. So we're moving towards having more portable technology. But it's an app for training, but it's not an app for doing it. So there's somebody that's saying that it is an app. It's an app for training. There's several apps for training from different, uh, tech, um, so, but it's not an app for doing the ultrasound. You actually have to buy the probe and connect it to, connect it to the machine. Any last questions from the audience here? Okay, thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. Thank you.